and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 188, The Great War, Brest Liptovsk, and Lenin's Retreat. Last time, we left off with those of the political left attending the Third Congress of Soviets, which started on January 10, 1918. The Bolshevik delegates had a slight majority, which meant they could decide the main issues if they stuck together. The easier questions, further establishing themselves as the party in power, though in the form of the Russia-Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, allies were still needed, and undoing the works of the former Constituent Assembly passed easily enough. Yet this was not the case when it came to the question of ending Russia's part in the Great War. The terms of brest litovsk were put to the Assembly, but did not capture a majority vote. So Trotsky, speaking for Lenin, was sent back to brest litovsk on January 17th. His goal, for now, was to stall. The Western Allies would never agree to a peace, and did not want Russia to sign a separate peace. But for Lenin, the only question was, what was good for Russia and his party? For now, the best the Bolsheviks could think of was to stall. After all, if Russia felt the strain, surely Germany did too. And this was true. Berlin had just put down a surging worker strike, and Austria was pleading with its allies for food. But then Germany was handed a gift, one that could have wrecked Lenin's dream and Trotsky's efforts. The Ukrainian government, the Central Rada, they were socialist but not Bolsheviks, came uninvited to brest litovsk Their leaders had many young men more comfortable with ideas than deeds, so they signed a deal with Germany, something Trotsky had purposefully been unwilling to do. To make this even more complicated for everyone involved, around this time, Red Guards from Russia pushed the Central Rada out of power. So, was there a treaty between the Ukraine and Germany? Germany was seeking Ukrainian grain and other materials to take care of its people and keep the war effort going, which meant, among other things, continuing to invade Russia. Trotsky had returned to brest litovsk on January 28th, local time, February 10th in the West, and gave the German generals and representatives a long and condescending speech about Germany's imperialism. As for the Germans across the table, they assumed this was Russia's swan song, prideful, but in the end, acceding to a greater power. It was not. Trotsky ended his tirade with neither war nor peace, as in Russia was leaving the war, but would not sign anything. Ironically, during this time, Russia's army, what was left of it, simply melted away, like the snows in spring. To Trotsky's speech, German Major General Hoffmann softly said, Unheard of. A diplomatic version of scratching one's head and saying, Well, I'll be damned. The Bolsheviks wasted no time heading back to Petrograd. After all, the horrid war was over for them and it seemed that the Germans were thinking the same thing, in regards to Russia. Celebrations were planned in Petrograd and Berlin, but... Someone in Germany, in a military uniform no less, realized, how can we trust that we will get the promised grain from the Ukraine? Simple, they could not. The only thing to guarantee that was the occupation of the Ukraine. This was officially decided on February 13th, the same day Trotsky reached Smolny and spread the news that the war was over for Russia, that Germany's eastern goal was not to smash the Russians and topple their Bolshevik government. Neither was accurate. The Kaiser gave his approval to continue the war against Russia. So some 450,000 Central Power soldiers soon reached the Ukraine. Of course, the Central Rada, pushed out by the Bolsheviks, welcomed the invaders. Then the German-led forces continued east. Within a relatively short time, the invaders had traveled 125 miles, or 201 kilometers, 
without having to fight a single Russian soldier. Minsk fell to the Germans, as did the other towns in between Minsk and Petrograd, for that's where the invaders were headed. On the same day, the German forces, under the command of Major General Hoffmann, renewed their march from Brest-Liptovsk. Lenin was holding a meeting of the Central Committee. The meeting had been called as word of the Germans' approach had reached Petrograd. Lenin, to his mind, got right to the point. For us, as well as from the international socialist point of view, the preservation of the Soviet Republic stands above all else. Or, in other words, giving away territory that they did not currently control anyways was no great sacrifice. Besides, when the European or worldwide revolution came, Russia, as the base of communism, would get back all its territory. Lenin called for a vote on his position, but did not win a majority. He missed by one vote. Stalin, standing beside him, had voted with his mentor, but still, it wasn't enough. Trotsky, it must be noted, voted against Lenin. So, Stalin spoke and got to the real issue, saying, The Germans are attacking. We have no forces. The time has come to say that negotiations must be resumed. Now, before this moment, Lenin and Trotsky had had their own meeting of the minds. Lenin had asked Trotsky, sometime in mid-January, what if the Germans renew their offensive and no revolution breaks out in Berlin? Would it not then be wise to sign a peace treaty with the enemy? Trotsky agreed that if those terms came to life, yes, that would be best. So after the vote, Lenin reminded Trotsky of his promise. The vote was taken again. Trotsky switched his vote, which gave Lenin a 7-5 to five victory for immediate capitulation. A message was sent to the Germans, signed by Lenin and Trotsky, that agreed to the original terms. The response from Berlin was silence. Specifically, the response from Hoffman was he kept his forces moving. By the 21st of February, the German forces had placed themselves in the middle of the Soviet-controlled Finnish Civil War. The October Revolution had caused a divergence of Finnish officers, and now they were attempting to decide, through war, who would control Finland. The Soviet-controlled group of Finnish officers, or those that wanted to throw off the yoke of Russian control. General Karl Mannerheim, fighting for Finnish independence, now had German help, and with this, he pushed back the Red Guards. His endgame was the extermination of the Bolshevik-backed Finnish Socialist Workers' Republic, and Stalin would remember this. As for Stalin, his rivalry with Trotsky had not abated, and now that the latter had made a mess of things, perhaps the time had come for Stalin to get rid of him. But what did that matter now, as the entire Soviet state seemed about to collapse? Dealing with this desperate situation in his own way, Lenin made contact with the Western Entente, asking for help in saving the Socialist Revolution and, therefore, Russia. Their response was just as non-existent as had been the German reply. Trotsky later wrote that, we were of the impression that the Germans had come to an agreement with the Allies about crushing the Soviets. Whether that was true or not, the revolution seemed about to end, and it would be Trotsky's and Bukharin's fault. We are turning the party into a dunghill, Bukharin told Trotsky. But on February 23rd, the Germans finally responded. Yet that response wasn't much better than the invading forces attempting to occupy Petrograd. First, Soviet Russia had to acknowledge the independence of the German-controlled Ukraine. The same recognition was required of the oil of the Caspian Sea and the vital Baltic ports of Finland and Estonia. The latter would be under German control. Not yet done, the Red Guards had to be disarmed the Navy decommissioned, and finally a huge indemnity was to be paid. Oh, and the Bolsheviks had 48 hours to reply, of which most of that had already passed by. 
The Central Committee quickly met. The conditions read out. Lenin's attitude was the same. The terms must be accepted. If not, he would resign. Zverlov did not hesitate to back his leader. Trotsky, not surprisingly, opposed accepting the German terms, as did two more members, as did Bukharin. But one other member took this disloyalty to the next level. He said, we must take power without Lenin. So, where was Stalin? His seemed to be the deciding vote, and though he spoke of accepting neither option, he soon backed Lenin. He could have used this moment to topple the older leader and pursue his own course for power. But it wasn't time yet. Besides, when he found out that Trotsky was abstaining, Stalin came back to Lenin's side to give him the winning vote and thus garnered praise and thanks. However, this was just the vote of the Central Committee. Yes, they had an official proposal to take to the Central Executive Committee, but it still had to pass an even larger body than that, but one thing at a time. The arguments flew back and forth during the early morning of February 24th. The German ultimatum expired at 7 a.m. Many of the non-Bolsheviks and left Social Republicans called Lenin a traitor to Russia, but the self-possessed leader shot back, Give me an army of 100,000 men, an army which will not tremble before the enemy, and I will not sign the peace. Can you raise an army? Of course, the answer was no. So the agreement with Germany was signed at 4.30 a.m. by a vote of 116 to 85, with 26 abstentions. Word of this was dashed off to the Germans, who knew they had the Bolsheviks right where they wanted them, so made the Russian representative wait while they grabbed more territory and altered the deal. Kiev was occupied, and the Central Rada government of the Ukraine, which had been chased away by the Red Guard, was reinstalled. Officially, the Germans signed on March 3rd, but the Russian official could not help but claim, enraged but powerless, it is your day now, but in the end the Allies will put a breast lift treaty upon you. And of course, he was right. Back in Petrograd, Trotsky was blamed for Russia's failure, and thus had to give up his position as Foreign Affairs Commissar. But Lenin would attempt to heal his wounded pride by making him the Commissar of War. It was an empty gesture, but for now, it helped. As for Lenin's popularity, it took a hit as well. After all, he had urged the October Revolution, the coup, and now the loss of 1.3 million square miles of Russian territory and some 50 million people. Nor were the Bolsheviks allowed to continue their propaganda within Germany, something Berlin feared much more than Russian soldiers. As can be imagined, the other members of the Entente were less than pleased with Russia, unilaterally pulling out of the war, and they would show their displeasure later with a de facto economic blockade and the seizure of Russian assets abroad. Amazingly, it had only been one year of Bolshevik rule, and the country was at its low point. During the 7th Extraordinary Party Congress from March 5th to the 8th, 1918, only 46 delegates showed up. The previous summer, that number had been 200. The left communists, who had strongly supported Lenin, rejected brest Liptovsk. Some of their number, led by Bukharin, started their own periodical, Communist. Its main goal was to reject the treaty and renew the war against Imperial Germany. But Lenin hadn't gotten this far by giving up or giving in so easily. During the three-day meeting, he thundered back that his opponents had brought them to where they were by rejecting the far better original deal with Germany. And again, through his sheer force of personality, won a majority of votes, 30 to 12. Four delegates had abstained, including Trotsky. It was another Lenin victory. However, it was meaningless as the Germans kept coming. 
And why shouldn't they? There was no one to stop them. Petovsk, a mere 150 miles or 241 kilometers southwest of Petrograd, was seized. And as it had a direct rail line to the capital, the Germans could be in Petrograd within days. Lenin still refused to give up, but not on the idea of giving up land to maintain the revolution, by issuing a secret order to abandon the capital. The Bolshevik party, at least those that mattered, were now en route for Moscow. Back in October of 1917, Stalin's newspaper, Workers' Path, had accused Kerensky of treason when he wanted to abandon the capital to a German threat as well. This forced the then leader to stay put. But something as trivial as shame would not halt Lenin. The revolution, and quite frankly, his newly acquired power, was worth paying any price. On March 10th, Lenin left Petrograd on an unregistered train. With him was his wife, sister, Stalin, Zverlov, and a single briefcase. And, of course, a unit of guards. Two other trains following behind carried the Soviet Central Executive Committee. Lenin's train arrived in Moscow at 8 p.m. on March 11th. There waiting for him was a relatively small party of workers. Lenin spoke to them and then headed to the National Hotel. But what had really just arrived was the firestorm that was Lenin, a few lieutenants to spread his word and some guards to carry out his orders. Movements had achieved great things with less. Days after Lenin's arrival, other trains came with other Bolsheviks, but only after they had stripped Petrograd of the Tsar's treasures. This haul impressed many Muscovites. Some were thrilled at having their city, the former capital, once again become the heart and soul of Russia. But not all were happy. The Moscow Council of People's Commissars declared its independence on the day Lenin arrived. This was, in effect, a declaration of war, and Lenin met them in kind. He soon established his own commission, staffed by himself, Stalin, and Zverdlov, and their main goal was to deconstruct the Moscow Council, which they straight away labeled as a Moscovite Tsardom. With the Bolsheviks in town, a mad scramble for property was launched as if who had the most or best structures would determine who would rule Moscow, and therefore Russia, what was left of it. Stalin joined in the struggle for space by claiming the Grand Siberian Hotel, but he lost it to the Supreme Council of the Economy, who had claimed it first. So he settled for a private house. And he needed the space, for he was a husband now. Just before leaving Petrograd, the future dictator married the 16-year-old Nadezda Nadia Aluyeva. She would spend her time writing to the wives of other officials of the very real starvation in the new capital. There is real hunger here. They hand out only an eighth of a pound of bread every day, and one day they gave us none at all. I even cursed the Bolsheviks. General Douglas MacArthur of the future Pacific Theater would insist that his wife Jean call him general, and likewise, even though Stalin used the familiar form with Nadia, she always used the formal. There was a large gap in their ages, of course. Eventually, Stalin would grab for them an apartment in the Kremlin, but really they were housed in a three-story outbuilding. Clearly, Stalin was not yet the powerhouse he would one day be. Now that the Bolsheviks had wormed their way into Moscow, it was time to hold the Fourth All-Russia Congress of Soviets, which started on March 14th. The question before the body was, again, the acceptance, or not, of Brest-Liptovsk. Lenin and his followers were called every name in the book, But the fact was that the delegates were voting on something they had not been allowed to read. Lenin had wisely hidden some of the worst details of the treaty. Still, with 1,232 delegates voting, 
The measure passed 784 with 261 against and 175 members abstaining. To strengthen his hand, Lenin had been in contact with the Western powers, asking them to join in the fight against Germany in Russia. He had promised that if they assented, he would wreck the vote. But no one answered him, so he pushed it through. It was his best move at the time. The British Navy would end up sending a squadron to Murmansk, but it was equal parts keeping the Bolsheviks in check and hoping to tie down German troops so they would not be sent back west. The latter plan would fail. The Western Allies would end up attacking the Bolshevik forces. To make Lenin's life more hellish, the Japanese would then send troops to Vladivostok to supposedly protect Japanese nationalists. But this lie was as old as time. This new threat would tie down Stalin for some time. Still, of the many fronts that consumed his time, he also approached the Ukrainian Central Rada, seeking peace. But this hope would be destroyed as the Germans betrayed the Ukrainians by establishing their own puppet government. In the end, Ukraine became nothing short of chaos, the Germans never getting the trains full of grain that had brought them to this point. Yet Stalin's most important assignment to date came from an unexpected quarter. During the war, Russia had captured some two million central power prisoners, mostly Austro-Hungarians. But as the war went on, the Entente announced that a new Czechoslovakian homeland would be established. With such a promise, some 40,000 prisoners decided to fight for Russia and had participated in Kerensky's June 1917 offensive. Soon after, the Czechs were put under French command, as Russia seemed about to be pushed out of the war. Trotsky had wanted to use them as the core of a new Red Army, but France said that they were to be sent to fight on the Western Front. This meant sending them to the port of Archangel, but that was still frozen in March of 1918. The only other option was to send them all the way east to Vladivostok to board ships. Yet Germany heard of this and demanded yet another alteration to Brest-Liptovsk that the Czech Legion was to be stopped and disarmed. As can be expected, the Czechs, who only wanted to fight the Germans, got tired of this back and forth, so revolted against their Russian keepers. In May, while in the Eastern Urals, the Czechs, thinking the Russians were going to turn them over to the Germans, seized the closest town, and since no one was around to stop them, took another, then another, then another. Soon, without thinking it through, they controlled the entire Trans-Siberian Railway, basically two-thirds of this reduced Russia. The Czech Legion had not intended to fight the Bolsheviks. They were, in the main, left-leaning. But as they were not allowed to fight the hated Germans, they fought anyone who attacked them. And Trotsky had sent out orders to subdue them. But now, it was Stalin's turn. Being sent out by the Council of People's Commissars on May 29th, Stalin was given control over southern Russia and was told to gather food for Moscow and Petrograd. Of course, this could bring him into conflict with the Czechs, but that was of a secondary nature. It was time for him to show everyone, or rather show up Trotsky, his efficiency, red ruthlessness. On June 6, 1918, Stalin arrived in Tsaritsyn, modern Volgograd, just 200 miles or 321 kilometers east of the Ukraine. If non-Bolshevik forces controlled the area, Russia to the north would not see any grain from further below. As the Bolsheviks had no army, the Germans were still taking territory, the Czech legion went unchecked, the Japanese seemed determined to keep Siberia for themselves, the last thing the teetering Russian revolution needed was to be forced to surrender due to starvation. But now, that was Stalin's problem, or opportunity.
Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, as you may have noticed, I've been taking a break the early part of this year. Um, All excuses aside or whatever, I've just been burnt out. Don't get me wrong, love the podcasting, love all the people I've met, all the experiences, but um, just doing several uh, podcasts with a full-time job and a family with small kids, just... It got to me, so I'm, I'm a little more refreshed, and I'm recharged and ready to come back, and so to make it up to you, what I'm going to do is I'll keep the Stalin bio going, because I'm enjoying learning about him and those times, and I think it's important to the overall story, and I'll keep the sea battles going in the Atlantic to get us caught up to uh, the time of Operation Barbarossa, just because I neglected it earlier, uh, but instead of waiting for all that to be done before we get to the Pacific... I'm just going to go ahead and mix in some stories, get the storyline going about what's going on in Japan and China, what's going on in the in the United States with FDR trying to help as much as he can, even though the United States is not in the war. So I'm going to kind of throw it all in there together, give you something different each time, get the story going, so then we can wrap up Stalin, wrap up the Battle of the Atlantic, start in the um, Pacific proper, and then balance out uh, the Pacific and Europe as best I can. So I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm going to jump into that. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I just I just needed to back off for a little bit. Um, for those of you who have not joined the Facebook page, uh, you should check that out because I'm going to start doing live shows that obviously will will stay posted on there. I've already done one about Hitler's chances of Operation Barbarossa. I had my very first one. I did um, wasn't wasn't very well put together, um, but that's my fault. Uh, about um, Hitler's chances of crossing the British Channel. The next one I'm going to do. The next couple I've got is uh, the rescue of Mussolini and um, the Maginot Line, that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to be doing some live shows. So if you're not on Facebook with me, check that out, and I'll try to make announcements for the live shows. Obviously, for those of you who are relatively new to this podcast, I also do a side series of memberships, uh, membership episodes. So uh, you can check it out on the website, worldwar2podcast.net, where you get two extra episodes a month where I try to do behind-the-scenes stuff um, that I just don't have time for in the uh, in the main storyline. Right now, we're currently doing the Spanish Civil War. Um, we've done uh, a whole bunch of other episodes. I think there's like up to 100 episodes, uh, membership episodes. So if you pay for that, if you sign up for that, you get access to all of those. So again, I just want to throw that out. Uh, again, just saying, hey, thanks for letting me take a break. Um, please check out Blue Apron. Please check out Dollar Shave Club. Uh, there'll be some other uh, stuff coming in the future. Just trying to to uh, justify spending so much time away from the family with with uh, with some making some money. Uh, but I will see you soon um, with um, Stalin, the Battle of the Atlantic, FDR's behind the scenes private war, trying to help Churchill, the stuff going on in China, and Japan. We're going to mix it all up. And just try to have some fun with it, get back on track, and get the story moving again. So, as always, thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening to the show. Take care, everyone.